Hey everybody, Matias here, also known as Realm Builder Guy. Welcome back to the channel and another chat about Darkness of Ur, my own tabletop role-playing game that is currently in a broad playtest and continued development. If you are interested in checking it out and downloading what I'm going to be talking about today, there's a link to Patreon down in the description. It is not behind the paywall, so it is completely free for you to grab and run with and give me feedback on. If you do want to support what I do here on the channel and help this project along, of course, feel free to become a patron and that would really go a long way in support. So, today's video, we're going to talk about playing the game and get into kind of the subsystems of the game as well as combat. I'm going to save magic for a different time. So with playing the game, um, here we're going to talk about combat and just the general stuff. We're going to start with the general stuff first. So there are a variety of conditions, of course, you can get, like being blinded, charmed, deafened. Exposure is a big deal. Fatigued is a big deal. Frightened, but exposure, prolonged exposure to extreme weather conditions can have an adverse effect on the adventure. So, you know, after six hours, you must succeed with a fortitude test where you are hindered on all tests and begin losing one BP and one MP per, per hour for as long as you are subjected to the exposure. So if you then find shelter, you are no longer dealing with exposure and you can start to rest and heal back up. So there are a variety of things here, paralyzed, poisoned, prone, restrained, stunned, unconscious, and wounded. Um, you know, kind of the standard stuff. Uh, but now let's talk about recovery and healing. This is something I thought a lot about. It's like, how deadly do I want to make this game? Healing is a slow process. Um, though a blessed being can call upon the powers of faith to bestow some healing upon a stricken creature, most of the healing comes through rest and medicine. So a successful medicine test can stabilize a person who is on the brink of death. A successful medicine test with a healer's kit restores 1d6 body points. Uh, characters mainly regain lost BP and MP through rest. So undisturbed night sleep, minimum of six hours, restores 1d6 body points and 1d6 mind points. Cooking food with cookware, sleeping on a bedroll, sleeping in a tent, help restore lost BP and MP as well. It's no um, associated gear section actually details what those do. But yes, cooking with cookware, uh, sleeping in a bedroll, a tent, all that stuff helps you regain health. Uh, sleeping in a real bed adds another 1d4. So if you spend a night's sleep, six hours in an inn, truly resting, it's 1d6 plus 1d4. Uh, so you can really regain a lot through that. Um, but if you're out in the wilderness, there's no bed. So it's 1d6 and you need undisturbed night's sleep. And then you can add some more if you're sleeping in a tent and so on. So that kind of reinforces the need for proper gear. So, death and dying. Whenever an NPC, fiend, creature, animal, etc. reaches 0 BP, they are dead. So, when you, the PC, the adventurer, reaches 0 BP, you fall unconscious and you are considered dying. A dying creature must roll a fortitude test. If they succeed, then they are stabilized and receive a serious wound as determined by the serious wound table. Down here. Should an adventurer reach zero BP while suffering from two unhealed serious wounds, you're dead. So if you already have two unhealed serious wounds and you drop to zero BP, you're dead. Uh, if they fail their fortitude test, they are dead. An adventurer who has died can cash in their luck to avoid death, spending all remaining luck, but it does not remove any serious wounds. It just stabilizes you at zero body points. Um, also using a medicine test, stabilizes you so you don't even need to do the fortitude test but that's assuming someone gets to you um but it's it's the same basic cashing in your luck so you'd still get a serious wound but you're simply stabilized you will remain unconscious until healing to at least one body point supernatural healing removes a single serious wound starting with the oldest but it cannot restore limbs ears or eyes so that's the general death mechanic. So it's relatively serious, and this is a game where you start with relatively low body points. So serious wounds table, you roll a d20 to determine what it is. It can be hand, arm, foot, leg, 
facial fractured, severed ears, gouged eyes, fractured skull, or pierced organs. Now, for anything where there's a left-right component, um, you roll a d20 to determine left or right for hands, arms, feet, legs, etc. Rolling an even number means left, rolling an odd number means right. So, um, if we look, for instance, here, an injured leg. Got a little asterisk there. The first serious wound results in a broken limb. The second serious room, loom result, a wound results in a severed limb. And the listed effects become permanent. So a broken hand takes three weeks to heal unless treated with supernatural healing. Um, if it's severed, it's, you know, you deal with this here. Cannot use anything with the injured hand. Cannot use two-handed weapons. Can still use a buckler strapped to the arm. Hindered on all tests that require the use of both hands. So, But if your hand is gone, this effect remains permanent. If you spend the three weeks to heal, the effect goes away, basically. Uh, losing both ears results in you being hindered on all social interactions and being deafened. Losing both eyes, same thing, and you are blinded. Odds are that basically means your time as an adventurer is done. Being blind... I mean, that's just time to retire the adventure and move on. So another subsystem I have that I already talked about that's very important to this game and kind of the design element of it is survival. So, you know, getting food and water when you're out in the Grim Reach or beyond is really important. So if you go more than two days uh, without food and water or water, uh, you lose 1d4 in body points and mind points per day thereafter. Um, so you can do survival wild tests to find food and find shelter and so on. You've got a survival table here for finding food. For instance, if you just want to be foraging for roots and berries, meal for one person per one day, the challenge level is a plus zero. So it's just straight up your survival uh, test. But if you want to hunt for large games, so for six people for a day or one person for six days, it's a minus four to find it. Um, and then you just have to be able to hit it and the animal's dead. Unless, of course, you're hunting something very, very dangerous like a bear, then it's combat. Travel is very important. Uh, the travel times, you can see here speeds on roads, forest hills, mountains, how that deals with miles per hour, miles per day on horseback, on foot, rowboats, or ships, and then weather, what that does here. So you roll every day for weather, and we have a spring, summer, fall, and winter table. If we look at spring, one to eight, it's a pleasant day. Travel speed stays the same. Visibility stays the same. Survival roll, it's modified by a plus one, so you get a boost. But if you roll a 19, it's a storm or blizzard, one of those freak spring blizzards travel speed is reduced in half visibility down by half it's a minus five to your survival and you must make an exposure exposure fortitude test against exposure and a minus two on the challenge level so it becomes more arduous and this is broken down by season to give you a little bit more guidance uh go into downtime here not only is that important for when you're training this is your cost per day squalor poor Modest, comfortable, or lavish lifestyles. Uh, if you are going to live in squalor or in poor conditions, that has a negative effect on your body. You can spend your downtime carousing, crafting, earning a living, and establishing an outpost. That's a key component of the game when you're out in the Grim Reach to rebuild society. Um, that's, that's kind of a, a key aspect here. Now, I don't have this all written out as far as how much this costs or that costs right now it's a matter that's part of play testing to go through it with gms i know how i would run it but i want to see how other people run it because it's not just about me it's about how other people see this and would interpret this now if you're going to find a, a settlement that and you clear it of all the evil horrible grim creatures in it well then you can start to rebuild it uh, well, you need to find wood, you need to find this, but it's not going to cost you money. It's going to cost you time. And that's part of the conversation with the GM to figure that out. Research is very important. If you want to find stuff on a certain topic, you can also start running a business. And this is how much it costs, how much the staff wages are, business examples like maintenance costs per month, staff required, income per month you can get. Then potions and elixirs are a really big part of this game. 
because not only do you have magic, but of course we need elixirs and potions that do different things. And you can go out and find it. If we look here, the life elixir, regain 1d4 body points. Market price is 50 gold crowns. Ingredient costs are 25. So if you're just going to buy the ingredients to do it, if you want to find the ingredients and get it yourself, it's within the boundary somewhere determined by the GM. And it's kind of a fetch quest. And the crafting challenge level to craft this is a minus two. But there are certain ones that I have here, for instance, Irresistum. See here the little skull and crossbones? That means this is illegal to use. If you get caught with it, dealing it or using it, there's going to be some serious consequences. This is 17th century justice, so odds are, you know, gruesome death. Here you get boosted on personality skill test for 1d4 hours, and it is found in the northern Grim Reach. So this could be one of those fetch quests where you find a merchant within the boundary that says, I want to find the ingredients to brew Irresistum. And I need 10. I want to find 10 worth of these. We're going to pay you X amount. Maybe maybe the ingredients cost. Maybe it's a thousand gold crowns. Find 10 batches of ingredients for, irresi for 10 uh, bottles of Irresistum. Go to the Northern Reach and it's minus six to craft it but this is where you need to go. And you can build an entire campaign just around fetch quests. And you can build an entire, basically, adventure group and society about people that specialize in going into the Grim Reach and finding potion ingredients uh, and what that can be a catalyst for future adventures. Now we've got combat. Uh, combat is obviously a big part. I enjoy combat and tabletop role-playing games. And this is... Along with magic, one of the most difficult things to work on specifically. Uh, so a combat round is a deadly part of adventure life, blah, blah, blah. It's divided into rounds of roughly 10 seconds in length. Each combatant has a turn each round in which they can take two main actions plus a free action. As I mean, it's very standard. Uh, before we do a surprise check to see if anybody is surprised, I do use initiative. Roll 1d6 for each side in combat each round, and the highest roll acts first. The GM decides which actions the enemies take, and the adventurers decide in what order they act. So a very simple D6. This is very old school D&D BX. It, it keeps it moving very, very quickly. You have two main actions. So I'm trying to limit the action economy and the amount of things you can do, because that will magically, not magically, that'll automatically speed combat up. Um, I don't like long slog combat. I like fast, dynamic, chaotic combat, which this definitely replicates. So some of the actions you can take, you've got melee attacks. So your combat test is modified by your targets, modified by your targets combat challenge level. Uh, you could of course roll, if you roll a fumble while wielding a weapon, you've got a mishap you can roll on. You've got ranged attacks, unarmed attacks. You can call upon gods or spirits, speak an incantation. You can move, either move a short distance or for two main actions, you can move a medium distance. So if you're going to do an attack and you want to do two attacks in the same round, which you can, um, it's the second test is always a minus two modifier. Um, so, but calling upon God's spirit speaking incantation always counts as two main actions. So basically you can only do that in the round. You can't move. You can't do anything else. You can still do a free action, but that's about it. But you can attack twice. Just the second one's going to be a bit harder. Raising your shield. This is something I enjoy from other games. So this is an action to raise your shield and add it to your armor value. The 17th century in Darkness of Ur, which kind of replicates that, um, there aren't a lot of uses of shield. Bucklers, yes. Freans use shields. Aelins use shields. But Orlanders don't tend to use shields. And obviously, if you're using a musket, you're not using a shield. Healing is a main action. Drawing a weapon is a main action if you don't already have it readied. Hiding, dropping prone, standing up, crawling, giving a motivational speech. Uh, so this can be at the beginning of any combat, but only at the beginning. It's a command test, challenge level set by the GM, and on a success, every member gains a plus two to their first test during combat, no matter what it is. Drink a potion and elixir, shoving, grappling, doing a precise shot, a called shot, and then free actions are like dropping an object or shouting a quick command. Damage is calculated using the damage roll of the weapon or spell, modified sometimes by physical modifier. And then we have mishap tables. 
So you roll a d20. If you roll a fumble and say it's a 15, you don't pay attention and nick yourself on your weapon, suffering 1d4 damage. Or you roll a 20, taking a blow to the head. You are stunned until the end of the next round. All your tests are hindered. So I like mishap tables. I like this kind of stuff. It adds a unique flavor to combat. Defending yourself, also, it's a, remember, this is a player-facing system. So the players make the rules for defending. Melee combat defending. So you are, you make either a melee combat test or a dodge test modified by your adversary's combat challenge level. Uh, if you roll a fumble, then you take double damage. If you roll a flourish, you get a counter thrust and you make an immediate extra attack, which I kind of like. Rage combat, defending, uh, you make a dodge test. It's always a dodge test to see if you've moved enough that it misses you. Uh, here, if you roll a flourish, you are armed. Uh, if you roll a flourish, so if you roll a fumble, it's double damage. If you roll a flourish, then you are, and you are armed. You have to have a loaded ranged weapon already. You get off a quick shot at your opponent. If you're holding a melee weapon, you can make a free move action to your benefit. So if someone is shooting at you, and you defend successfully with a flourish, you get a free move right away to your advantage anywhere on the board, so to speak. Uh, you've got unarmed combat defending and defending against magical attacks. It depends if it's targeting your mental or physical state. If the magical attack is a ranged attack, you may take a dodge test. Um, a fortitude test, otherwise, if it's not a ranged attack. So, um, if you roll a fumble, you suffer, suffer double effect, which can be pretty bad. If you roll a flourish, you are boosted as determined together with the GM. Here's an example. You can find cover. You get within striking distance of your adversary. They are within a reasonable range. You get a quick shot off with your pistol and can make an extra attack. Surprise, we already talked about. Two-weapon fighting is a thing. Um, so if it is your second attack in a round, you receive a minus two to your combat test. If it is your third attack in a round, which could happen if you're two-weapon fighting, you receive a minus four. Mounted combat gives you an advantage. Dealing with multiple attackers uh, is a thing. Cover, shooting in a melee, shooting from elevation, and then combat distances. So this isn't a game necessarily that I want to be tactical in the sense of, say, Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but you can play it that way. It's more general bands of movement and ranges. So ranges immediate is within 5 feet. Close is 6 to 10, short 11 to 40, medium 41 to 80, far is 81 to 150, and extreme is 151 to 250 feet. So ranged combat weapons have maximum ranges listed uh, that operate without a distance modifier. You can be used one distance segment further than listed, and then you are hindered on your ranged combat test. Now we get into powers of sorcery, but we're going to talk about magic and all that good stuff in the next video. So I hope you enjoyed that kind of quick overview of how to play the game and combat and some of the subsystems within it. If you want to check this game out, your own playtest document of exactly this, you can find the link down in the description to Patreon. It's not behind a paywall. If you want to support the channel and this kind of work, uh, feel free to become a patron. There are other benefits behind that as well. And you can check out my website blog as well, realmbuilderguy.com. So until next time, I'm Realm Builder Guy, also known as Matias, and I will talk to you soon.